Hey guys, Fedora here. Now, this was meant to be a review of the much-requested Killjoy Psycho Circus. Unfortunately, the copy I ordered never arrived. So, seeing as I needed to do something in a hurry, I decided to swap it in places with what I was planning on doing for my 100th episode, which is what you're about to see. So, Killjoy Psycho Circus will be done, it may just have to wait a little bit longer. So apologies for that, but I still hope you enjoy regardless. Welcome to O oh the Horror. I'm Fedora, and welcome one and all to O oh the Horror's fourth year anniversary. Happy birthday! And as I mentioned at the beginning, this was supposed to be review number 100 for no other reason other than I just wanted to review a silent movie. Also, this may be one of the first cases of copyright infringement in film, as this dramatic retelling cartoon will now demonstrate. I'm pretty sure that's how it happened. Anyway, let's check out this symphony of horror and see if it was worth Mr. Murnau's premature death. 1922's... Nosferatu. Ah, uh, I love this era of cinema. You have no doubt in your mind what's what with these opening credits. Hutter, his wife, his sister, an estate broker. A listing method like this should have made whodunit movies a lot shorter. Nosferatu. Does this word not sound like the death bird calling your name at midnight? Well, sure, if my name happened to be rah, rah, followed by the sound of shit landing on my car's windscreen. So this movie actually starts in the fictional German town of Visborg, where we meet our Harker stand-in for this movie, Hutter. Huh, <laughs> how long did it take you to come up with that name change, guys? Along with his wife, Ellen, who, from the looks of that face... I'm pretty sure he's planning on eating that cat. Speaking of faces, enjoy seeing this in your nightmares tonight. And what a lovely marriage these two seem to have. Together for what I can assume is many years, and yet Hutter still brings freshly picked flowers to his wife every morning. Yeah, pretty insensitive, man. The slaves worked their asses off in the garden to plant those. On his way out the door, Hutter runs into this guy next. Uh, what does he have to say? Not so fast, young man. No one can outrun their fate. Well, that was weird and mildly threatening. Uh, you have a pleasant day now, okay? Meanwhile, at the Notre Dame Bell Tower, this is actually our an estate broker by the name of Nock, who Hutter works for. And he tells our hero that a Transylvanian count named Orlok is moving to their little town. Oh fuck, another low-budget movie that takes Dracula and renames him Orlok? Are there any more similarities to that travesty Dracula 3000 I should expect? Jesus, this movie was pretty bold for its time. They decide to set the count up in the makings of the Great Depression amassing outside their office. And Nock sends Hutter off to meet the count and make him the offer. So... 
what? He's just going to send him halfway across Europe to say, do you like this house? Uh, what if he says no? Uh, are you just going to go back and forth with different photos of other abandoned factories? The company expenses must be the real horror story here. I'm suddenly not so sure Hutter's marriage is that happy because he seems a little too excited to be leaving. Meanwhile, Ellen's face just says, Leave your keys at the door, asshole. Thus, Hutter entrusts his anxious wife to the care of his friends, the wealthy ship owner Harding and his sister. She's to be fed once a day and allowed outside for no more than 10 minutes. I don't want to get any of these new age independence ideas. So Hutter hops into his 22 Mustang and drives to Transylvania, where taxis just throw your luggage on the ground because, hey, this is Romania, you peasant, we don't give a fuck. Then he mentions his appointment with Count Orlok in the local pub, and everyone looks pretty petrified. Except for this guy, he just looks like he's practicing his Jersey Shore audition face. You can't go further tonight. The werewolf is roaming the forest. Werewolf? What, this thing? Now how is Lon Chaney Jr. supposed to fit into that costume? After flipping through a couple of JPEGs, Hutter calls it a night, and I think it's time I mention the soundtrack. Now as a silent movie, actor body language and music had to do all the work to make up for the lack of dialogue. And music was provided to the theatre going audience via an orchestra that would play live. And I will say, the music really does a good job of setting up the gothic feel of this movie. Although, the more normal parts come off as a little overly whimsical. It sounds like his next word box is going to say, You there boy, what day is this? Well, no need to worry about where coyotes now that the sun is up, off to Orlok's castle. Or as close to it as possible, as the drivers refuse to head over the mountain pass, forcing Hutter to continue on foot. As soon as Hutter crossed the bridge, he was seized by the eerie visions he so often told me of. Ooh, I don't like the sound of that. Ooh, what sort of visions? Hurry up and get in, I gotta get this baby all to a Benny Hill sketch in 10 minutes. So we finally met Max Shrek's Count Orlok, and he's working as a taxi driver? Man, and we thought Bella Lagose had it rough. We arrive at last at Count Orlok's castle, where he is already impatiently waiting. So that wasn't him driving the carriage? It was just some random? Ugh. What are you saying, Nosferatu? That all Transylvanian vampires look the same? Hashtag BLM. Well, that's the end of Act 1. Oh good, because I gotta take a slash. Oh bloody hell, stupid DVD copy. Hey, things are getting a little steamy now. After Hutter cuts his finger, which gets all like all hot. Can we not stay together a little longer, my lovely man? It's quite a long time until sunrise. And the movie does nothing to assuade that assumption because it just cuts straight to the morning after. Dearest Ellen, I've suddenly grown a huge fetish for large bushy eyebrows. Hutter notices two small holes on his throat when he wakes up, which seems to make him oddly happy, and decides to actually write a letter to his wife. Uh, excuse me, we can clearly see he only has one sheet of paper, yet these shots show he is writing a paragraph on several... <laughs> Bam! Plot hole. Night falls once again, and the two are back on the paperwork. But Orlok seems far more interested in a picture of Ellen that fell from Hutter's luggage. Your wife has a lovely neck. I know, right? I tell her that all the time! Orlok then agrees to buy the dilapidated factory, which happens to be basically next door to Hutter's house, coincidentally. So business is concluded, but Hutter by this point has grown very suspicious that Orlok may not be all that normal. Hutter! Such language is unbefitting for this era of cinema. That's right, hide under your covers, he'll never find you there. 
Meanwhile, Hutter's friends aren't keeping an eye on Alan, and what happens then? She starts sleepwalking. This never would have happened if we just put her in a cage like her husband asked. Thanks to Ellen's strange behaviour, Orlok leaves Hutter alone, and the next morning, instead of legging it like any normal person would, Hutter sticks around to witness more of the vampire's power. Ugh, you're not fooling anyone, Nosferatu. We can clearly see the horses moving between cuts. 3 out of 10 on the visuals movie from 1922. Orlok has now ditched his castle and is on his way to the new place, which brings us to the end of Act 2. So he should be able to make it from Romania to Germany in the time it takes you to grab a packet of Maltesers from the candy bar. Act 3 opens up with Hata having escaped the castle and being cared for at a nearby hospital. Not that he has to hurry back or anything because his boss has recently been put in a mental institution. Yeah, very creepy and all, not Renfield. But can we take a moment to look at this guard's moustache? Forget the ship, Orlok. You probably could have brought all your coffins along on that thing. We also meet our Van Helsing for this movie, Dr. Bulver, who should probably be getting back to Diagon Alley to sell some wands. Hutter, knowing that there's a vampire after his wife, is determined to get back to Germany ASAP. But Orlok has a big head start on him, and on his way, pretty much wipes out the entire crew of the ship. The dead ship had a new captain. So this was the origin of Justin Somper's Vampirates? Act 4 begins by telling us that Orlok uses his powers to make the ship move with supernatural speed straight towards the still delirious Ellen who at this point is currently proposing her love to this tree. And it works, as his ghost ship finally drifts into Windscore Harbour, with Orlok poking his head out, looking like a drunk celebrity sneaking out of the back door of a paparazzi-surrounded nightclub. <laughs> uh, it kind of takes away from the horror of the whole thing a little bit, seeing this guy stumbling around the streets with his coffin like some lost pizza delivery boy. I also like the way he looks at the building he just bought, like... Shit, I spent 14 whole dollars on this. Meanwhile, Hutter finally makes it home to his wife, who clearly hasn't been fed or watered since he's been gone. And the police, led strangely by Jack the Ripper, do a once-over of the corpse-filled ship and bring in some local brains, including Boogie 2988's grandfather, who determined that plague is the most likely cause of death. Bolt all windows and doors. Too late, guys. Plague has already chopped down your doors and stealing all your stuff. Act 5 starts off with some young scoundrel doing some tagging. Oh, wait. I guess Orlok has been busy in the couple of hours he's been in town? If some time was meant to have passed since the last act, what the hell has Hutter been doing this whole time with a murderous vampire living across the street from him? Can we come out now? No. Well, I don't know where he is, but Ellen, on the other hand, is reading up on vampires from his book and in it seems to be a way to save them. And it involves, and I quote, her apparently crowning Nosferatu's cock. Oh please, you expect a gentleman of my caliber to make fun of old time English? I use it all the time. I mean, just the other day my buddy was asking me how I was feeling and I looked him dead in the eye and said, gay. Okay, uh, what I think it means is Ellen has to offer herself willingly to Orlok before sunup to make him stop his relentless killing spree. A spree which is unsurprisingly driving the townsfolk to paranoia as they suspect the recently escaped Nock as a vampire. He strangled him. He's a vampire. Ah, yes, of course. Vampires are known for strangulations. That night, whether it be Willing or Orlok's hypnosis forcing her to do it, Ellen indeed offers herself to the Count, and Hutter runs off to fetch Dr. Bulvar. And seeing as there's only five minutes left in the movie's runtime, he's got quite a long plot dump to give the Doctor in a hurry. With the Count's infamous silhouette closing in for the kill, naturally the guys take their sweet ass time in getting back to the house. But it turns out the problem solves itself, as while feeding on Ellen, the sun comes up and screen wipes Orlok to death. So the sunlight does hurt him? I guess all those times you saw him walking around in what I assumed was broad daylight, that they sort of jumped over that little detail. 
The master is dead. Well, at least I can keep his deposit. And so, with Ellen dying, and Van Helsing standing there like the utterly pointless space filler that he was, this movie comes to an end with a, well, the end. And that was Nosferatu. Obviously, judging this movie by my modern standards of entertainment wouldn't be very fair. Yes, it did feel like it dragged on a lot with sequences of scenery or just nothing. I also felt the music in some places was a little out of place, but onto the much more important positives, the dark imagery of this movie holds up quite well, and is very haunting, especially the shots of Orlok just standing, motionless. It's pretty damn scary. The whole thing had a sort of opera feel to it, which in a sense was still what film was at that point. There's no doubting this movie's importance to cinema history, and the countless movies it's inspired. Just as there's no doubting, or to me at least, that while, yes, it's not really a movie you watch these days just to watch, but it is definitely a movie that you should respect. And that's all for this big anniversary of Other Horror. And I know I say it a hundred times, but I'm just so grateful to every single one of you who have supported me for all these years, and hopefully will continue to do so for as long as I continue to do this. I also want to thank all of the YouTubers who have uh, helped me out for this uh, for this year, and again, for hopefully the years to come. Notables, of course, include Bob Show, Shades of Dak Game, Cartoon Hero, Sebastian Venom Martinez, Brian Gatto, Confused Reviews, and so many more. I've loved working with all of you. Well, that's all for me for tonight, so I'm Fedora, this is Oh The Horror, save a screen for me, and we'll see you next time.